Hi, thank you for taking some of your time to watch this pre-recorded Crypto 2020 video. Our paper reports on three computational records which we have recently obtained, two related to integer factoring and one related to the computation of discrete logs of a finite field. I'm Emmanuel Tomé and this is a joint work with five co-authors. Four of us are from the same group in Nancy, France. When we deploy cryptos as a major decision to make, which is a decision on the key size, depending on your interest, you might have different things in mind. If what you want is that your crypto computations be quick and be cheap, then you want short keys. If on the other hand, you're, you are interested in security above anything else, then you want longer keys. So there is a compromise that is needed. As an end user, you might be very confident and trust the manufacturer to have done the right thing, to have taken the wise decision. But even if you're confident, the sad fact is that, is that there are many outdated crypto products that are lingering. What everybody can do or should do is check that the crypto products that we are about to use abide by the recommendations of NIST, for example. Now, so the tricky question, especially for public crypto, is how do we make these recommendations? We have to base them on harmless assumptions, but these harmless assumption, assumptions have to be based on assessments of cryptanalysis for key sizes that by definition are out of reach. So how do we make these assessments convincing? We need to base our assessments on hard facts. We need to base them on state-of-the-art software implementations and what these implementations give for, key, for sizes that are within reach. And we need to go to some effort to obtain computational results that show that we have done our best to provide results. So it, need, it means that we have to explore algorithmic ideas that perhaps pay off only for very large sizes. We need to explore the question of whether our algorithm scales, uh, whether we are encountering stumbling blocks, whether we can harness a large amount of computing power. And overall, we need to show that this cryptanalysis uh, is more than just theory. It's actually something uh, that can happen for real. So it's also important that we make our work reproducible. Another important aspect of our work is that we address both integer factoring and computation of discrete logs of a finite field. And it's, ac it's actually a fact that people uh, believe that discrete logs uh, over finite fields are a lot harder than factoring integers. And this is based on the observation that uh, records for finite field discrete logs uh, over the years have been lagging behind by several dozens, if not hundreds of bits. Uh, one of the takeaways of what we do is that this harness ratio is not as large as one can think. So I'm going to give a brief introduction of the number field save, which is the algorithm we use uh, for our computational records, and then highlight some of the key aspects uh, of our work. So the number field save algorithm is a complicated algorithm which goes through uh, many steps. So what I want people to have in mind is that there are two particular steps, which are relation collection or saving and linear algebra. And these two steps are the most computationally expensive in the algorithm. Uh, they have different characteristics, but the bulk of the computation time actually goes in these two steps. To give a brief explanation of NFS, I need to, to start with polynomial selection and explain what NFS does. So polynomial selection is the first step of NFS. And within polynomial selection, we select a pair of integer polynomials, and one of them defines a number field, Q of alpha. Uh, and when NFS, select, uh, when NFS collects relations, uh, what it does is that actually it searches for pairs of integers A and B, such that two fairly exceptional events occur. Namely, that the integer A minus B M and the principal ideal generated by the element A minus B alpha in the number field, both factor into a small thing. We say that both are smooth. Small things means here small prime numbers, and here it means small prime ideals. But you don't have to, to bother with prime ideals and that sort of things. Just have in mind small things, and what you can think of with prime numbers is close enough to the reality. When we, when we have such pairs AB, 
we say that we have relations. And what we want to do with relations is that we want to combine them, to combine a subset of them, uh, which is not easy to, to guess, uh, so that all the multiplicities that appear in the factorizations are even. And this is done by linear algebra. Uh, when we have uh, such a combination with even multiplicities on both sides, we have an equality of squares, and we have actually many equalities of squares. And each of these, uh, when mapped modulo n, gives us a non-trivial factorization of n with probability at least one half. So this is how NFS factors integers. Uh, the funny thing is that NFS is also adapted to compute, computing discrete logs of our finite field. And there's more or less a dictionary translation from one to the other. The only major difference is in linear algebra, because while in the context of factoring integers, we had linear algebra over z over 2z, here it's over z over lz, where l is something a lot bigger. So some things uh, change, the balance of things uh, change, and we have to adapt to it. But the general pattern of uh, what the algorithm looks like is pretty much unchanged. OK, how do we collect relations? Uh, I'm going to address uh, two fairly classical aspects of relation collection in NFS, and then uh, give some description of what we did in order to choose the parameters uh, for our computation. When we search for these exceptional pairs AB, we are essentially searching for needles in a very large haystack. Uh, so there's a question of how we divide the work. How do we arrange so that several computing units can participate in the computation simultaneously? So there's a trivial strategy uh, that consists in uh, splitting the search space in rectangles. And then uh, the downside of this is that the yield is pretty unstable. And at the end of the day, it doesn't work too well. Instead, we prefer to do what all the computational records have been doing for years. Namely, we use what is called special Q sieving. We constrain a factor Q to appear in one of the factorizations, and then uh, this defines many independent tasks, one per Q. The yield becomes stable. And because we have prescribed a factor to appear in one of the factorizations, this is also one thing less that we have to find. OK, now, how do we actually find, within one of the smaller search spaces, uh, how do we find the smooth ABs? Uh, it's a question of finding potential prime factors that appear in the factorizations of a minus b m and a minus b alpha. So the strategy uh, pretty much depends on the size of these potential factors p. For the prime factors below some bound b, which we can choose freely, we strive to find all pairs such that p appears. So it means that we are going to go to some effort to find all the ABs such that 17 appears in the factorization, for example, or such that 73 appears in the factorization. Uh, to do so, we use a process which is called sieving, and this accounts for the name sieve in the buffer On the other hand, for primes above B and up to the bound L, which is the maximum bound uh, of things that we allow to appear in the factorization, uh, which we can also choose freely, and this is an important aspect of the parameter choice, uh, then in this range, we are opportunistic, uh, meaning that if some factors show up, uh, then we take them. But if we miss some, then no big deal. So how do the relations that we encounter look like? Uh, here are some example relations. We have the blue things that are the large primes above B. The red ones are the ones that we have constrained to appear in the factorization. And then there's a question of how many blue things do we have? Because the, the black things, we know that we are going to have many of them. Uh, so we're, we're bound to use some non-trivial linear algebra to, to find a magic combination that has all the valuations even. Uh, on the other hand, the blue things are going to be rare. And we are going to, to keep this rare uh, aspect uh, of the blue things 
So in order to do so, we are going to set a limit on the number of blue things that, that can appear on each side. It means that the two relations here, I'm going to discard them because I say that we have too many of the blue things here. Uh, so this means that before I do linear algebra proper, I'm going to try to do some cheap linear combinations uh, in order to uh, to get a smaller matrix. I'm going to, to try to cancel uh, a blue prime here with a blue prime some other, some other place and this is going to to simplify the, the linear algebra work that is, that is going to happen afterwards. Okay, next. Uh, given these uh, observations, uh, it's important to understand that the relations that have only two large primes, and maybe even less, they are really a blessing because they participate in the chip combinations very easily. Essentially, these relations are trading one blue thing for another. So it's very good uh, because it helps the, the set of chip combinations going. Uh, so we, we will use these relations to do the early filtering, these chip combinations. Uh, and if we have only relations with two large primes or less, then the filtering will essentially get rid of all of them. So, of course, because I have two sides to deal with, it's a bit more complicated than what I'm saying, but essentially this is the idea. Also, one thing we, we want to pay attention to is uh, how does Q uh, participate in all of this? I mean, does Q uh, go with the black things? Uh, where I, I'm going to have many uh, appearances of uh, each prime factor, or is Q going to, to go with the blue things? Uh, and is, is it going to, to participate in the set of things where I want to eliminate uh, the, the prime numbers uh, as far as possible? So it's also something important. For RSA 240, the strategy that we used is that uh, we used uh, Q from about half the, the bound B to way above it. And for Q below B, so Q being among the black things, which is exactly the situation I had uh, in the example relations two slides ago, uh, I allow two large primes on side zero and three large primes on side one. In contrast, when Q gets above B, uh, Q also uh, goes with the blue things, uh, then what's going to happen is that I'm going to decrease the maximum number of large primes that I allow on side one. Uh, so that the number of large primes plus Q, that also makes three. So the relations, whether Q is here or here, are more or less the same shape. So this strategy was uh, really effective in getting rid, of getting rid of most of the P above B on side zero. And on side one, I still had uh, many of these, but that's not too bad because in the context of factoring, uh, linear algebra is re relatively manageable. So now for GLP240, which, which was our discrete log record, uh, we wanted to go to a lot of effort in order to reduce the matrix size because the, the linear algebra task in uh, the GLP context is much harder, so we wanted to go to some effort to, to have a smaller matrix. So what we did is that we chose to constrain uh, factors Q that were composite, uh, so that when we write down the factorization of all the relations, the things that are related to Q are actually two distinct uh, prime factors that both belong to the range below B, and they do not interact with the things that we want to cancel. Uh, this strategy was extremely effective, as we will see, in reducing the, the size of the matrix uh, and essentially getting rid of all the primes or most uh, of the primes between B and L. So that was uh, very important. Another aspect I want to mention uh, not necessarily related to the previous, but uh, I want to mention it because it played a role in our computation, is what we call batch smoothness detection. It's an alternative to sieving. It's uh, a fun way to find the B smooth parts of many integers. This is due to Bernstein in 2000, 
and the idea is to multiply everything together. Uh, by, by doing so and by keeping track of the tree of subproducts, uh, it's actually possible to find the B smooth parts of all the A minus B M's. And this algorithm does it in time that is quasi linear in the input side, uh, thanks to the use of asymptotically fast FFT like multiplication algorithms. Uh, so this finds all the primes below the bound B, for example, so just like sieving does. Uh, the downside is that it requires some memory, but on the other hand, in the context of NFS, uh, this, uh, this helps uh, save memory in several uh, occasions. So overall, the, this is uh, very often the benefit. So we used it uh, in part of the parameter ranges for our computation, not always, but pretty often. And this is detailed in the paper. Okay, now on to linear algebra. So linear algebra, as I said, is the second most uh, important part in the computation. And as I mentioned as well, there's a huge difference between what we have in the context of factoring and in the context of discrete logs, namely that the field of definition changes. So linear algebra for DLP is harder. For this reason, uh, our strategy was aiming at having a smaller matrix for DLP. And this was pretty effective, as we can see, uh, because by spending a lot more effort in finding relations for DLP, we were able uh, to obtain a matrix that was much smaller. It's important to notice as well that this matrix, in both cases, is very sparse because it has very few non-zero elements per row. Here, this is less than one non-zero in a million. Uh, with this kind of sparse matrices, the algorithms that you want to use are iterative algorithms, meaning that you essentially rely on a key operation, which is the multiplication of a sparse matrix times a vector. If you want such an, such an operation to scale, it's not sufficient that you go to the computer cluster that is in the basement of your CS department building. Uh, instead, you want to use an algorithm that has this scaling functionality sort of built in. And this is the case of Copper Smith's block Wiedemann algorithm, which dates back to 94. This algorithm uses not one, but n independent sequences compared to the original Wiedemann algorithm. And these sequences are shorter. So it means that uh, in this case, the scaling of the algorithm is almost perfect with respect to n, the number of sequences that you have. So of course, there is a downside, which is that you need at some point to reconcile the work that you have done in several independent sequences. I mean, by independent, I mean that I could be running a sequence uh, in the US and one in France with no communications. So it's very independent. So you have to reconcile the work. And the more sequences you have used, the harder it gets. So you can uh, do a back of the envelope calculation of the complexity of the different steps. And it's important to understand also that the underlying operations in most cases uh, are slightly different. Here you are essentially uh, measuring the performance of uh, the, uh, the memory of your computers, while here you have operations that are uh, slightly more delicate uh, to deal with. So I mean, uh, these are different characteristics. OK, good. Now on to software resources. Uh, to do these records, we use the CADO NFS software, which we have been developing in Nancy since 2007. It's a huge piece of software. It's open source, LGPL licensed. Uh, it's an open, uh, an open development model. I have a link to the GitLab here. And regarding just relation collection, uh, it's a huge part of CADO NFS, which has undergone many improvements uh, in the last four years relating uh, to parallelism, for example, or to the freedom of choice that we have uh, for the parameters. And also, uh, we have many improvements that are pretty recent uh, related to our capacity to predict the runtime and to assess the, the validity of some parameter choices. Regarding uh, linear algebra, it's also an important part of uh, CADO NFS. Uh, and likewise, we have seen many improvements uh, in the last four years, uh, some related to discrete logs specifically for the multiplication of sparse matrices times vectors. And more recently, 
we improved uh, on the generator step computation uh, by using uh, more parallelism and uh, this was key to enabling uh, the use of many different sequences. I mean this, this allowed us to to have uh, an implementation that scaled mo uh, much more than previously. If I draw this kind of uh, pictures uh, with the time to solution as a function of as a function of the number of the number of cores that I am using, uh, a perfect algorithm, uh, one that scales perfectly, achieves a straight line. And thanks to our new implementation of the generator steps, thanks to uh, the flexibility that the block Wiedemann algorithm offers, uh, I have something that approaches a straight line up to several thousands of cores. So this is something we're pretty satisfied with. Okay, we used many computer resources, of course. We used several in France, in the US. We also used the compute allocation on the European price infrastructure. Uh, and since this means several different computer clusters, it also means uh, several uh, software installations, different job schedulers, different policies, uh, different kinds of bugs. Uh, it also means that we had to, to have recovery procedures uh, in some cases. Uh, so that was also an important uh, part of the work. Okay, I can draw uh, an approximative timeline of our computation. Uh, here I have the different steps of the three computations that we are reporting in millions of core hours. So this is the hardness, so to say, of each step. And here, this is the timeline and the surface of each thing is proportional to the hardness. Uh, so we started with relation collection for DLP and then relation collection for RSA 240 and then linear algebra was in the summer last year and finished in the fall because I mean, some implementation work uh, had to be done and uh, by the time we were nearing completion, completion of our records it was pretty clear that we were going to have some of our allocation time left so we started RSA 250 in fall 2019 and this was over in February 2020. Uh, okay, so it's also possible to give a total cost uh, in core years or core hours, depending on what you prefer. And uh, I want to highlight here the fact that uh, if you do the total of uh, relation collection and linear algebra, in both cases for RSA 240, you reach something that's slightly below 900 core years. Uh, while for GLP240, you get something that is slightly above 3,000 core years. So the ratio between the two is only slightly above a factor of three, which is not that large. Also, uh, I, I mentioned that our results are reproducible and uh, this uh, can be checked with this link where, where we give parameters of all the steps of our algorithms and uh, of our computations and instructions on how to reproduce part of our computation. So as a conclusion, uh, we did more than just records. We developed parameterization strategies that can be used for further uh, computations. We also developed a framework for simulating NFS that is not perfect. I mean, there is some detail about it uh, in a paper, uh, but it, it was essential in guiding uh, our parameter choices. Uh, we also show that our implementation scales well and can tackle larger problems. So we have the feeling at this point that we are not hitting a significant technology barrier uh, and it's possible to go further. Comparisons are always good. Uh, we can compare our DLP240, which is 795 bits, to the previous record, which is DLP768, 232 digits. And in fact, we had access to hardware that was identical to the hardware that was uh, reported as having been used for the DLP768 computation. And what we found out is that our harder computation would have taken less time on that hardware than the reported time for the DLP768 computation. So this is something that we are pretty happy with. Also, as I mentioned, uh, we learned that the harness ratio between finite field DLP and integer factoring is not as large as one can think. So for future computations, we intend to keep the focus on uh, the 
anticipation of the computation cost and our ability to uh, to anticipate that and also we want to show that we are able to harness a large amount of computing power Okay, thank you. This is all I wanted to say. So thank you for listening and looking forward to your questions